Today I would like to tell you about our studies of uh, uh, visual event related potentials and give you some very uh, superficial details of uh, our pre-processing analysis and visualization of uh, and, and statistics, what is the most important, of the effect of egocentric reference frame in the processes in the cortex during visual stimulation. Uh, the first cortical area where the uh, visual information arrives after uh, thalamic uh, relay is striated cortex. Uh, and this area is in the very center of our attention during uh, today's talk. It is very important to know a few basic rules of how the information from what is projected on the retina uh, is transferred to uh, the primary visual cortex. So, the information is inverted in two ways. First, what is left in the real world is projected on the right, and what is top, the upper visual field, is projected in the lower part of the uh, calcarine sulcus. This is the medial view on one of the hemispheres. And this is how the information from our retina is projected in the sense of eccentricities. The more central information is, the more caudal is the projection, and the peripheral uh, pieces of our visual field go to the depths of the brain. What is very important about this structure is that it is quite uniformly oriented across individuals and that those cortical surfaces, they look in the opposite direction. This allows us to selectively achieve uh, electrical voltage induced by either one part of the primary visual cortex or the other part of the visual cortex recorded from the surface of the skin with EEG. Uh, we are going to be focused on this part of the visual field, which is the periphery. Uh, and one of the reasons is that this part of the primary visual cortex has the best shape which corresponds to our task and which fits to this cruciform model uh, proposed long ago by Jeffrey and Oxford. This model explains why the voltage of uh, the event-related response at the surface of the occipital uh, part of our head have opposite voltage, as a negative or positive, as a function of where the stimulus is shown in the the visual field or in the bottom of the visual field. We are going to stimulate independently those two parts of our visual field and subsequently subtract one waveform from the other waveform in order to achieve a difference wave. And this difference wave is going to show us few important components. The first one is called C1. It is neither P nor N because of the alternating uh, polarity as a function of where do we stimulate. And this is the very early uh, visual component which we can record from the cortex. It starts about 50 milliseconds post onset of the stimulus and peaks uh, 20 uh, 
milliseconds later. There is also another component which shares the properties with C1, and it is called C2, just because it is later. And you will know much less about what it is. The overall consensus is that C1 reflects primary visual input or feed forward in the V1, and some researchers claim that it is also V2 and V3. While C2 apparently, and there is not much of evidence about this, but apparently it is a reflection of the feedback in the very same or about the same brain area from other extra straight uh, cortical sites. This is how uh, the difference in the voltage between C1 and C2 is explained due to different location of the dipole, the voltage is indeed opposite for C1 in comparison to C C2. But still, there is this beautiful difference between the response to the top visual field stimulation and the bottom visual field stimulation. We subtract, subtract one from the other, and we achieve both components. Uh, typically, what can be used is stimulation bilateral in uh, the shape of wedges, simple checkerboard wedges. The exposure can be very brief. The interstimulus interval can be also really, really short if you don't ask uh, subjects to, uh, to execute any, any kind of task. And this uh, approach of subtracting one response from the other, top from the bottom, uh, basically eliminates the subsequent non-specific components like P3, etc. So normally you have a flat line before 50 milliseconds, and after the components C2 and C3, about which I'm not going to talk a lot today because I know what is it even less than C2. There must be again a flat line. So the brain activity is still there. It is just the lack of the difference between the top and the bottom retinotopy. Uh, this is an individual example of about uh, 400 trials, which is pretty fast if the interstimulus interval is one to two seconds. And you can see that, indeed, the polarity of the occipital, the location is also beautiful. It is always in the center and in between uh, of electrodes uh, OZ and PZ, central parietal occipital electrodes. So the, the polarity is opposite for C1 and also for C2. And there is a lot of other components which are distributed if we consider them separately. But when we subtract one from the other, we see a beautiful manifestation of C1, C2, and Mysterious C3. This is a larger view. Uh, those multicolored lines are the electrodes. And those are topographies. As uh, shown by the application in MATLAB, which is called EG Lab. For plotting topographies, this application, this toolbox, is quite useful. Also, for the analysis of the data, I use uh, custom-built uh, scripts in MATLAB. Uh, 
this is easier and simpler. And later, well, not during this talk, but later I will show examples of how it works. A few uh, properties of C1 and C2Z uh, were discovered during our piloting trials and uh, what is uh, known from, from other uh, studies as well. Uh, C1 is much more conservative. It is sensitive to physical properties of the stimulus. Obviously, if you change the contrast uh, or the, the size of the stimulus, this will affect the amplitude of C1. But C2, like you see on this plot, is sensitive to the exposure. Interestingly, if the exposure of the stimulus is longer, the amplitude of C2 is dropped three times. The contrast sensitivity is also not the same for C1 and C2. And C1 is much more sensitive to the contrast, while C2 somehow fits the lack of, fills the lack of the stimulation with some kind of feedback. Uh, the situation about anatomy is way more complex than we try to imagine using this model. And the shape uh, of uh, the V1 is not the same. It is conservative, but it varies a lot uh, between individuals and to a greater extent in the foveal area, in the most posterior part, which uh, which is responsible for processing of the central vision. Therefore, if you try to stimulate separately the periphery and the center, you see that uh, typically the peripheral C1 is much better, of much higher amplitude than the central one, while there is no such a striking difference between the C2 can be a reflection of a different distribution of this response along the depths of uh, calcar and saltus. Another evidence of uh, such a difference is that if we compare the topographies of the peripheral response and the foveal response, the difference will be significantly higher for C1 comp uh, component than for C2 and C3. And another interesting property of C2 is that it is sensitive to stimulation of the meridians, so the horizontal and the vertical line. In those alternative stimulations, here we don't stimulate what is in the middle of the quadrants and here we stimulate them. And the amplitude of C2, unlike C1, is much bigger when the quadrant is fully complete. And also the same pattern for C3. If we go more to the, the cognitive and executive function uh, involvement, we can see that C1 can hardly be modified by anything task related. It is dependent on the stimulus. If you compare a passive task when you are not, uh, you are not asking anything from the subject, they are just watching and fixating, with another task, a simple reaction time task where they have to respond to every presentation, the C1 is no different. But C2, C3, and all the rest of the components, obviously, they are much greater for the active task. Special attention. Something that is well known for the components like P1 uh, and uh, N1 and uh, etc. Uh, can selectively stimulate the C2 component. There is debate in the literature if attention can do something with uh, C1, but at least at the level of the special attention, we were not able to, to demonstrate 
Here I, I want to speak about something that is very basic and related to the analysis of uh, the event-induced activity recorded from the surface of the sky, which is commonly called event-related uh, potentials. Uh, the main property of this signal is that it is terribly noisy. And typically it is impossible or nearly impossible to identify this kind of response from a single trial. Also, it is present behind the noise. The noise is not necessarily the noise uh, from the power line or from, uh, from anything artificial. This can be natural noise, ongoing uh, electrophysiological activity of the brain, one of the heaviest sources uh, of uh, the noise, physiological noise, is alpha activity. In uh, some subjects, it is really huge. Uh, and uh, in order to overcome this problem, uh, what we do is a multi-trial averaging. As you can see in this illustration, after adding more and more trials, the noise, since it is a random signal, cancels itself out of the response, while something that is consistent and replicated in all the trials, or overlapped at least, is preserved. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that we are not at all sure, so we assume this, that the latency of the response is the same each time. The latency can vary. And the variation of the latency of the response affects the amplitude and the shape of the resulting average waveform, peaks, etc. So if the, the responses are highly synchronized, the amplitude is greater. If they are scattered, along the timeline, uh, it is likely that we don't achieve, achieve anything. But this is another illustration how the same response, if the latency is jittered, give different wave shapes and uh, different responses. And if we add one average and the other average, we can result with uh, something uh, entirely complex and impossible to separate. Therefore, we introduce our artificial jitters in, in our design. The intervals between the stimuli should vary a lot. First, so that uh, we can avoid any prediction or expectation of the simulation. And second, in order to refine as much as possible uh, the response of the interest. This is a beautiful example of uh, how it can work when the ERP is stimulus locked or the response locked. Those are two different paradigms. And apparently here, the latency in a natural way varied as a function of the variation of the response time. And if we look, look the response, the epoch to the response onset, response time, the changes in the induced activity in the brain, which is now typically before, mostly before the response, is very different from what is achieved from the stimulus locked ERP waveform typically contains a number of peaks, which are called with letters and numbers, P1, P2, and so on. People typically assume that each peak corresponds to a single underlying latent component. Here you can see C1 as well, which is very small. This is a model, indeed. What is shown here 
and uh, Steve Locke tries to illustrate how peaks don't correspond precisely to the component. For example, the component. Now they are arbitrary components, obviously. Peaks over here, while the peak achieved at the level of uh, the, the row signal is much earlier. Because this waveform is the result of averaging of those three independent This is another illustration where, uh, in a very nice way, he illustrates that the very same wave shape can result from a number of different shapes, latencies, and amplitudes of the latent components. Uh, and Apparently, the only, or the, the easiest and the most pragmatic way to get an idea what happens with the component uh, is to subtract one condition from the other. This is another uh, illustration of how the amplitudes of the peak can be modified in a weird way with the variation of the amplitude of the component. Decrease in amplitude C2 this one, makes us believe that peak 3 and maybe component C3 is increased, but this is not true. So, a number of rules which are proposed are as follows. It is always good to focus on a certain component, which is typically dependent on a very particular experiment. This experiment is good for one component, but it doesn't allow us to make any uh, conclusions about the other components. It is good to use well-studied, well-verified experimental manipulations which are reproduced many times, and it was well dem documented and demonstrated that uh, the results are totally predictable. Uh, it's good to focus on large components, big response, good statistics. Uh, good to isolate components from diff with different waves. If we don't compute different waves, we have a mixture. Even if we computed the mixture uh, of many different subcomponents is inevitable. But uh, the difference way of approach allows us to get rid of many unnecessary information and to concentrate on what we really need to, to measure. And we focus on those easily isolatable components with known characteristics, topography, latency, amplitude, there is also an option not to take any component into account at all. We just compute uh, global field power and then we know if something happens in the brain overall at a certain latencies, but we have no certainty of where exactly did it happen and uh, in which anatomical structure, of course. Uh, and it is a very good advice to grab good components and useful designs from other domains. If you work in vision, maybe it's good to go to language and to look there. They can propose something extremely useful for you if you can adapt the, the paradigm for your tasks. Design. Uh, 
писав програму моя. Великий. У, я Це ж англійська. Дес Сіулі. Where is Forlis? We use the large checkerboard wedges, which are located 10 degrees uh, eccentrically, always on the periphery. Here you can see the red dot, little red dot, which is the fixation dot. So the subjects were asked always to look at this dot, and we controlled if they fixate well with eye tracking. Uh, this strange butterfly location, asymmetric in the top bottom direction, uh, is chosen because this is what has been recommended by previous researchers who did the, the mapping of what is the best polar direction to locate the stimuli to achieve the, the maximum signal to noise. So all the parameters, the, the widths are 30 polar angles always. And uh, the, the angular distance from the straight ahead direction of the fixation point was 10 degrees, either on the right, uh, right or on the left. So the blue is horizontal meridian, so this is the level of the eyes, and the red is the, the midline, the sagittal midline. This is another drawing. It looks like a no. This is a straight ahead position of the stimulus, and this is what is qualified as eccentric. And in other presentation, how did it look? As you can imagine, if you use a flat screen, what is on the periphery is further away from you. And you have to correct the size of the stimulus. We didn't want to do it. And luckily, in the lab, uh, in, at uh, CERCO Center in Toulouse, there was a nice semicircular convex screen. With the help of this screen, we were able to project those peripheral stimuli uh, and to be sure that the distance is always the same and the physical, uh, physical shape of the stimuli is not altered. So this is one condition, gaze right, and this is other condition, gaze left. And in red, we highlight the wedges, which are at the given moment, straight ahead. In blue, they are peripheral. Of course, those stimuli were presented one by one, not at the same time. Here I show just the overall layout. And now, Works. The pre-processing pipeline of uh, the achieved row time series of the EG, 64 electrodes, included the D-mean, 
of uh, the traces. Linear the trend. Filtering with uh, low pass cutoff of 10 seconds, 0, 1 hertz. Uh, then epoching, sampling 600 milliseconds before and after the onset of the stimulus. The stimuli, by the way, were very brief, just to screen frames, which corresponds roughly to 30 milliseconds. Then we did epoch rejection based on the, the noise. The noisiest, the 10% of the noisiest epochs were eliminated in an automatic way. Uh, electrode rejections, we rejected for the noisiest electrodes, typically they were in the front and in general in the periphery. Uh, due to the, the eye motion and uh, the, the, the mimicking muscles. And finally, mean reference. We compute the reference among the, uh, the, the, the mean among all the electrodes, and then we subtract each electrode from this mean, which allows us to put all the electrodes in approximately equal situation and given the reference was occipitally this allowed us to to view better responses focused occipitally results so now we have some beautiful figures i'm specifically proud of this is the the grand average which clearly demonstrates those two components also even in this case here it is a zone of uncertainty, and we cannot be sure when one uh, component is over and the other starts. Also, the second, the C1, C2 component, has a pretty unsure peak. It is flat, so the peak is hard to identify, but I managed to do it. Uh, the GFP, global field power, beautiful and simple trick. You compute uh, a standard deviation across 64 electrodes or 60 electrodes or 30, doesn't matter. And it goes up when something happens somewhere in the brain. When there is nothing on the baseline, it's flat. And after this component is over, it is also mostly flat. Well, I don't show it, but you can trust me. <laughs> This is the topography. Beautiful central topography for both components at this tight point. Well, grand averages are always beautiful. This is 29 subjects. For one subject, it is typically 400 trials. But it is a fast uh, paradigm with one to two seconds inter stimulus interval. Because the late components must, might overlap, but since we concentrate on those C1, C2, we are safe. We can go in faster. If it is a passive paradigm, when you just track the, the flickering stuff, uh, then the interval can be uh, less than a second. But this GFP, global field power matrix, can be with equal use achieved at the individual level. Individual summary statistics, we have a matrix of, uh, I don't know, a number of uh, time points, 64 electrodes, and we compute standard deviation for each time point, for each individual. So we get this GFP curve for one condition, for the other condition, and for each individual, for each subject. And this gave us nice, positive finding of a greater GFP at this point, we are not sure where exactly the difference in the, uh, in the eventuated response is distributed across the, uh, the scalp. But at this time, the conditions are discriminated. Unfortunately, nothing, really nothing at the level of C1.
And with other methods, we, we get exactly the same result. And this is another method of which I am particularly proud because the design of our paradigm allowed to identify those components in the majority of the subjects at the individual level. So the signal to noise is good enough. What we do here is in a predefined a priori time window, we are looking for the peaks across all the electrodes. We identify five strongest electrodes. We average them up. Now we have one curve in this time window. We identify the peak and the amplitude. And this is an individual score, which is later analyzed statistically. Now we have a sense of topography, though there can be variation, a bit on the left, a bit on the right, you know. Those are locations of the electrodes we use to identify the components. And this is the difference, the effect of the straight ahead against eccentric. What does it show? All the range, positive and negative scores in C1, pretty random, and a significant effect in C2, though a, a large variation exists here as well. C2 significantly greater for straight ahead, the individual level already, and C1 not. Now, we want to go one step further, and we want to identify at the same time if there is a difference, when this difference happens in time between the conditions of interest, and where this difference happens, if there is a consistency across all the subjects in the location of this effect, which is already brain mapping. And for the brain mapping, we use SPM. SPM is mostly an fMRI tool. But instead of fMRI, you can use it for analyzing EG. First, you need to interpolate at, a, at each time point the electrode data into a plane by 32 in this case. Then this image is stacked with other numerous imaging uh, images. I downsampled them a lot. 10 times, let's say, 100 times. To create a 3D image, X, Y coordinates is the space, and Z is time. And finally, we have another dimension, which is the condition. One condition and the other condition. Two 3D images for an individual. And the next dimension is individuals. So we can compute summary statistics across individuals based on those 3D images, space-time images. And this is what we achieve. This is very significant. Corrected for everything possible. We have a huge occipital block of significant activation of increase of the signal at the level of C2 and also at the level of C1. The topography, by the way, is not the same. C1 is obviously more anterior than C2. But our topic, uh, our goal was not to characterize the distribution, the location, the consistency of the components. Instead, we wanted to see the effect of the condition, which have to be not only strong individual, at the individual level, but also consistent in the location on the scalp. And we achieved such a result. The significance is much less. It's uncorrected, 
here for the illustratory purposes, but the peak is significant, corrected for the number of voxels and the smoothness, and the size of this cluster is also way above the chance. And where it is located, and when does it happen? It is located within the body of C2 component, in the late part of C2 component, which corresponds pretty well to what we demonstrated with GFP. But now we know the place where it happens. And this is just for an illustration, it's not for statistics. The time curves of the peak. Obvious fishing, but looks pretty much the same as for the, for the GFP. And again, if you look at the stage, at the time slot of C1 component, we get nothing. The conclusion is that Greater feedback, but not fit forward activity, induced by peripheral straight ahead stimuli in the early visual cortices. And the perspectives of this study, they are cool and exciting. Apparently, this prioritization of straight ahead portion of the space around the body can be explained by local increase in excitation of the extrastriatal visual cortices as a function of the gaze direction. What I did in order to achieve those images was a very basic Fourier transform, spectral amplitude for 10 Hz estimation, didn't fight much with the noise, just quick and dirty, a flat image of this amplitude for each individual. We had two groups, 29, 29 subjects, and SPM statistics to correct for multiple electrodes, etc. So this is F test. It shows pretty significant three, three large clusters, two of them occipital. But what is most interesting is this post hoc. What do we expect? If the gaze is on the right, the stimuli which are on the left are projected to the right of our brain. And in order to achieve a greater feedback, we need some kind of greater excitability at this point, even before the stimulus arrived. Just because we fixate on the right, the excitation must be greater on the left, because the left is now straight ahead. I don't know if it is valid, at least at the level of the special attention, people demonstrated the very same phenomenon. Maybe we implicitly, unintentionally focus our attention on straight ahead. So this, this wasn't somehow induced or stimulated by the task. The task was simple, you respond to everything as fast as possible. But the activity of the alpha oscillation at 10 Hertz was reduced on the side corresponding to the gaze direction. And contralaterally, not very symmetric, but still, we achieve an opposite effect by the sign. And this is statistics of the, of the peak, also very beautiful, with some noise. This is already some mechanisms of why the C2 and P1, which has been also demonstrated here uh, in this study, but I didn't discuss uh, during the presentation, why they are greater for the straight ahead stimuli. Because even before the straight ahead stimuli, on the blockwise manner, the appropriate part of the brain is somehow better prepared for processing of the stimulus. Why there is no behavior? This is a great disappointment for us all. <laughs>
Prediction time is no different. We tried many things and never achieved uh, a significant difference. My speculation is that the task is not good. And the reaction times, though it was 300 and something milliseconds, much later, uh, after the components we observe. But maybe the activity underlying the components altered by straight ahead didn't affect much the execution of simple reaction time task. And in order to get a behavior, we need to, uh, to provide a more complex task with attention, discrimination, detection, etc. And my expectation is entirely positive that a simple task will be affected by the, the condition we are interested in much less than a complex task. Thanks for your attention. Thanks to all the contributors of this study. And uh, any questions are very welcome.